What's up, gang? Welcome to The Greatness Machine. I'm your host, Darius from Shaz Day. I'm so pumped to have you here with me. Now, listen, The Greatness Machine, we're about two things. Number one, people who live in their passions. And number two, those who are creating greatness in the world and doing both of these things despite the odds against them. Each episode, we're going to feature interviews with game changers, business leaders, you know, telling us their origin stories, what made them tick, what got them to where they are now. Why? So it can help you step into your greatness within your life, your business, and your career. Occasionally, you might hear a few solo episodes from myself, moi, as I say, as I leverage my 20 years of entrepreneurship as a CEO and founder to help you grow and level up in your journey to scale your life and your business. So come be a fly on the wall, enjoy the conversation, and I'm stoked to have you here with me. Guys, welcome to today's episode of The Greatest Machine. I'm your host, Darius Machazi, and boy, do we have a special guest. My man, Joe Duran, is in the house. What's up, Joe John? Hey, Darius. Good to be here, man. Oh, man. I'm so pumped to have you here. Joe John, do you mind if I do a little bit of housekeeping and then we're going to get going? Oh, I might dreadfully, yes. Don't ruin my day with housekeeping. <laughs> oh, no. Go uh, ahead. So- all right, I'm doing it. So listeners who are new to the show, The Greatness Machine, we're about two things. People are living their passions and those creating greatness in the world and doing so despite the odds. And my man Joe here is neither short of passion nor greatness. So I'm going to give a little bit of color here on how I know Joe John because um, we've met. So we met three years ago and I was launching my book. I'm talking about my book all the time. And we have a mutual friend in common, Matt Stewart. And I said, and I said to Matt, and Matt goes, oh, you're, you're launching your book. You, you got to talk to my friend, Joe John. You know, he's, he got on all these t- news stations and I mean, he's New York Times bestseller. I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? So we had a call. Joe, Joe was very gracious, gave me 30 minutes of his time, talked about his book launch and I'm, I'm, I'm doing the, the core value equation. And then, uh, and then, you know, and then we kind of fell off. He was busy, busy guy. And we'll talk about why he was so busy, but he was a partner at Goldman Sachs at the time. And then, uh, you know, that was the end of it. It was just like, oh, cool. Like two acquaintances, no big deal. Fast forward three years later, I end up in the wealth management space. Now, what I didn't say a moment ago was that Joe John was the, <laughs> he was the head of wealth for Goldman Sachs for the whole world. And so I'm, I'm in the space now, so I'm kind of paying attention. And I see in one of the industry publications that Joe Duran was leaving Goldman. And right around the same time, you had done Matt Stewart's podcast. So I email Matt. I don't know if you know the story. I emailed him. I said, hey, Matt, I have two questions for you. Number one, do you think Joe will do my podcast? And number two, do you think he'll be an advisor for my, at the time, um, private equity fund that I'm starting. And he goes, yes to number one. I don't think so for number two. <laughs> so and you got that, the number two first before you got number one. <laughs> who would have thought? <laughs> who would have thought? So, um, so anyhow, um, fast forward a couple months later, we actually have a phone call and Joe just rips into, into my idea with my, my business partner at the time and just rips into the idea but says he wants to have another phone call. That next phone call turned into many more phone calls. And uh, now we're building Rise Growth Partners together. And uh, it's been a good voyage so far, man. I hope so. I've enjoyed it. That's for sure. <laughs> it's very different than what we first talked about. <laughs> if I, that's it's going to be in size proportions anyway. Definitely much bigger, much bigger, much more interesting. Yeah. Um, I'd love if I could give a little bit of your formal bio. And then uh, we love sure. origin stories here at the show. So we'd, we'd love to jump into your origin story. You so, bet. Um, Guys, Joe found, was, uh, he's a serial entrepreneur. He's founded some massive, massive wealth management firms that have been massively successful. Um, most notably, he just sold uh, a few years ago his firm, United Capital, to Goldman Sachs, and then ran all Goldman Sachs wealth management uh, for, for all Goldman Sachs. But he uh, he's we should recently... Just be clear, there was private wealth and personal wealth, which was the million to $25 million group. But that's the group that I run. And there's the private wealth, which I did not run. So to make My sure if anyone from Goldman hears this, I wasn't the king of Goldman. I was uh, right. a partner at Goldman. I, it was I, a I good size business, $120 <laughs> billion, $1.2 billion in revenue. So it was a pretty substantial business. I'm, I'm going to make sure I correct myself next time. PFM, right? Personal finance. PFM, so, yeah, personal so, finance. So, yeah. so now I know what that means. I never asked yeah. before. I just assumed yeah. it was the whole enchilada. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, and now he's the executive partner at Rise Growth Partners, our new firm, uh, New York Times bestseller, all around amazing human being. But uh, Joe, welcome to the show. I'm so Thanks. proud to have you. I'm, I'm, I'm even more proud that this is the second thing we're doing. And the first thing was the business thing. Yeah. But uh, I'd love if you could give some of your personal stories, some of your background or origin story to our audience. 
So uh, the accent, which is still here, is from Zimbabwe. I was born in Spain, in Barcelona, uh, lived in seven countries before I was eight, and ended up in what was Rhodesia and grew up to a broken family, a very abusive father, physically abusive. And um, in the middle of a civil war, when I was 12, 11 or so, uh, my parents got divorced. My dad had been in an awful motorbike accident, and my mom who never even graduated high school, taught herself to read and write, is by herself in what was Rhodesia. And uh, I was 11. She was cutting my hair and she said, I'm leaving your dad. He was still in the ICU at the hospital. And she said, you're the man of the family. And um, not long thereafter, you know, it was, I don't need to get into all the awfulness of what that felt like, mostly because my dad then came out of the hospital and, um, very often would try to break into the house and just really not healthy. Uh, and then I had to protect my two sisters when we'd go visit on the weekends, which led to a lot of beatings, which I was too small to fight against. He was quite a large man. And um, in my school life, uh, Rhodesia then became Zimbabwe, but my parents were functionally bankrupt uh, because the divorce of my dad was not a successful human being. And uh, the school that I was in uh, was... 80, 95% white kids and 5% black kids. I'd been raised as racist. That's what the way the country was at the time. If you were white, uh, even if you're Spanish, you were considered white at that time. And um, the school then, Zimbabwe, Rhodesia became Zimbabwe. My own school went from 95% white kids and a few very rich black kids to 95% black kids and 5% really, really poor black, white kids. So it was like a complete mirror inversion when I was 13 or so, 12 or 13, uh, 13, I guess. And um, it was remarkable because it, it was the core foundation of something I learned, which is everything I thought was true turned out to be not true, you know, mm. because these kids who I'd been taught that I was superior to were better athletes than me, better students than me, had all the same dreams and wishes I had, wanted to have fun, wanted to get through school, hated as much as I did. We'd play rugby together. We'd fight about girls together. We'd do all the same stuff, get drunk together at an inappropriate age. And I'm like, my God, we're all just humans. And it was my first, not my first, but one of my early questioning of authority and the rules and the things you think are true. As we talk a lot today, I think great entrepreneurs think a lot about being different and challenging the status quo. That was one of the first real kinks in the armor to my reality that made me go, oh, like it's like the matrix. There's this whole other world that is unimagined by me. And when some of your fundamental beliefs get changed, you start to question everything. You know, take one small step to a different path and everything appears completely different. Anyway, I left when I was 18 years old with 200 bucks in my pocket, land in England, tell my parents I'm not coming back. And lo and behold, I get mugged in London. They take everything, my backpack, my 200 bucks, my ID. And in Zimbabwe, was the reason I left with 200 bucks, even though I worked my whole life from 11 years old on, was you couldn't take out more than $200 uh, from Zimbabwe. It was a controlled currency because of uh, uh, sanctions and inflation and all the rest. And so I have 36 pence in my pocket, no credit cards, no cell phones. It's 1989, so it's quite a while ago. And there's the only way to call home is you have to call reverse charges, but Zimbabwe wouldn't accept reverse charges. And I'm like, I would rather die than go home. I'm in the snow <laughs> for the first time in my life with my cheap sneakers and my Zimbabwean jacket, which is definitely not made for English snow. And I'm sitting on a park bench and I go, I would rather die than go home. So wow. I slept in the South Kensington train station. I meet this guy who's milling around too. He was the only one that had a toilet, a restrooms in it. So I'm like, well, at least I won't freeze to death. And he <laughs> and I then, it, again, and this is why I believe in manifest destiny. Like I re believe in serendipity. The world gives you what you need because I should, by all good reason, have failed and gone home. But because I chose not to, the universe put Dave Rogan in my path. Mm -hmm. And he was milling around too. And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I've got no money. I've got no idea. I've got nothing. 
And he said, me either. I got my, I said, I said, I've got 36 pence in my pocket. He's like, I've got six. You're six times richer than me. <laughs> and we slept in the train station. We then got jobs at a youth hostel. And from that, I traveled all over the world, ended up in college in, in, uh, in uh, Cal, at, at, in, in the United States, paid for my way through school, and the rest is history. And so that was the start of it. Uh, we can get into how I then started into business, but some very important lessons from my first two parts of my life that have shaped me as an entrepreneur, as a human. The first one is that you have a choice as a human being to either believe that the world is kind or hostile. And I, this is a quote from Albert Einstein that I came across when I was 14 and really down in the dumps, really not sure that it was worth being alive because it was so miserable. Uh, really awful home life. My, I'd have to go on weekends, get the crap beaten out of me by my dad, trying to protect my sisters, failing and protecting my mom, having to make money but not making enough to really support anyone other than myself. And so at that moment, I came across a quote from Albert Einstein said, the most important decision a person can make is whether they live in a kind or hostile universe. And it struck me as a remarkable idea that I could choose to think the world was kind. And if you think the world is kind, then you're going to be a good human being and you're going to do your best and you're going to believe in justice and fairness and you'll get what you deserve. It'll all work out. Basically can the ask, idea of karma. Can I ask a question and, on that? Yeah, sure. So having grown up in an environment that was host that that one could easily perceive to be hostile you know if you're have an abusive dad hostile you know even living in a country where there's war and, and you know this is like visually and physically you're you're in hostility hostility is it's almost like um we had a guy on the show that was talking about being pickled in in what you're pickled in it's like almost being pickled in hostility yeah how how, how did you flip that and say i'm going to choose for kindness like how am i going to choose like, what, how did you live? What was your perspective around that if you're going to your dad's house on Saturday and dealing with his bullshit? Because if the world work? is kind, it is giving you what you need. I needed to go through that hmm. to give, to get what I deserved, what the world would give me. And the idea that you can choose, no matter what your environment, how you're going to, what lens you're going to look at that world through, I just found it incredibly intoxicatingly freeing. And I was wow. not a religious guy, but the idea that there was even something in the universe that would allow for, for the idea of justice, of kindness or hostility, hmm. implied that there was some greater thing. And yeah. I'll call it God. You can call it whatever you want, because I don't think the labels matter. The idea that there is a rhyme and reason to the universe and to your own life, that it's there for a reason and you need to accept it and give it everything you've got. That's your only responsibility is to experience it and leave it all in the field. And guess what? If you're wrong and the world is hostile, we're well, going to get kicked in the teeth anyway. Might as well have an optimistic viewpoint. That was Albert <laughs> Einstein's primary point. Yeah. If you have to choose and you choose it to be hostile, you'll be miserable your whole life waiting for the bad thing to happen. And if it doesn't happen, you'll have wasted your life. And if it does, you weren't going to protect yourself anyway. But if yeah. the world is kind, then there's never a bad outcome because every bad thing that happens is training for the good thing you're expecting. And if you're wrong and it never comes, well, hell, you'll die saying the good thing's happening tomorrow. Yeah. So I just found it to be really rational, even though I'm a very emotional human being. And it just spoke to me in an intellectual way to say, hell, if I got to choose, I'm going to choose the one that guarantees happiness, that yeah. guarantees purpose and mission, and that makes my mission to be just an experiencing human being. And, you know, as times pass, I've become more of a, a student of Zen Buddhism. And I, and I meditate every day. I've been doing yoga for 25 years. The more I realize that good and bad are just opinions of a particular time. They are not truths. That that's yeah. just an opinion you have at any particular moment. The tr truth is, Life is an unpredictable voyage, and your only responsibility is to give it all you've got and be in it. If it's crappy, wallow in the crap. If it's good, really relish it, because it all swings, man. These are all just moments in time. And guess what? In a thousand years, no one will remember either of us, no matter what we do. And yeah. so if we're little speckles in a universe that has rhyme and reason, 
then just give it what you got. And, you know, for me after that, my whole purpose was to make a dent in the universe, to make a positive impact on everyone I touch and put myself last. When and, you were, so let me ask a question. So when you, when you, you were 18, obviously, so you said you were 13 when you had this realization and yeah, then you 13, end up. 14, in, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says a young teenager. I have a thirteen-year-old yeah. son. I mean, that's yeah. that's a kid. He's a kid, right? Yeah. I, mean, I love, I love him. But he's still a boy. I mean, he's becoming a man. And and so, you suddenly, fast forward five, six years later, you're in the UK, and 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 even in that moment, in the toughest of moments, you still had that perspective. At that well, moment, yeah, I'm sitting on the park bench, and I decided, I, I'm here. I'm. I might as well just be here in the freezing cold and see what the hell happens. And you know what happens? The whole universe opened up. Like, it's remarkable. There will be, in my life, there's been four specific moments that changed my entire pivot of my life. And that will be true for everyone listening to this. There are going to be moments which at the time are usually really awful. And you learn who you are, where there is a choice in having faith or not having faith, believing in yourself or not. And those crucial moments will determine your entire life. And ultimately, it is that one decision. Am I going to choose to believe in the world or not? Am I going to take the step or not? And any time I get that knot in my belly, like, oh, should I do this? I'm like, hell yes. I lead with yes. Everything starts with yes. As Matt Stewart will tell you. you know, <laughs> Former guests on the show as well. So, yeah. so let's 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 forward search a little bit into um, you know how did you end up in the states? I mean, that's obviously like a a you were I, I guess coming from uh, Zimbabwe. Were you able to go to the UK because of the yeah, it was, like it the, was the heritage? Yeah, and my dad was half American, so that helped. Okay, but the the US. I grew up, and this is something again. I know I'm an immigrant, so some of the listeners might have some awful comments about us immigrants, but. When I was growing up as a 14-year-old, I would watch a show called Dallas. There was a guy on it called J.R. Ewing. And your <laughs> older viewer, viewers and, and listeners will know this, but the younger ones won't. But it painted this picture of this, what America was, this incredible place where you could do anything. And I'm like, that is where I belong. I just know I belong then. I can't explain it, but I, I turned to my mom and I go, hey, I'm going to go to America. I'm going to be like J.R. Ewing, a good version of him nonetheless. And she's like, <laughs> well, you're an idiot, you're ugly, and you're lazy. That's not a great combination for doing anything. I'm like, well, guess what? I'm doing it anyway. Wow. And that was, so I just knew that I was meant to be in America. And so I came to school here. I actually just did this with my daughter for her, how you became an American. I got a, you, when you came to school here, you got a one-year student visa. I had met Jen, my wife of 30 years now, in Spain. She proposed to me uh, after I graduated school. Um, this tiny little earring, I said, I'm not taking it. And I went and spent all of my very limited funds on a tiny little ring. And then I started working as an intern at a very small RIA. I studied finance and marketing. I was a mediocre student. I joke with my kids. I had a GPA of 2.3 from St. Wow. Louis University. That's where I ultimately baby. graduated from. But I was a great rugby player. So I was captain of every rugby team, played in uh, played for the team Missouri in the Western States. But uh, you learn most of building a business is not what you learn at school. It's what I learned on the rugby field. That you each have a role and you have to, your job is to lift the people around you up. I have a motto in my life as, as a CEO of a few firms now, which is to help brilliant people do brilliant work. Like your, your job as a leader, your job as a, a human is to create the conditions where people can really shine and to surround yourself by people who want to shine. Because there are some people who just choose to be miserable. And I try to avoid those people at all costs because they bring yeah. you down too. And so for me, uh, when, when I started, I, I, to go back to the, the starting the business, I started as an intern in a firm that would hire me because I traveled the whole West Coast with my wife trying to meet money managers. I had a degree in finance and marketing. Again, a crappy GPA, but I had the degree anyway. And at the very last stop in San Diego, there was a guy, Bob Doty, 
who was a PhD from University of Chicago, had just bought this very small RIA with 30 million in assets, three employees. And he said, do you want to go be an intern? And I've just been offered a job uh, by 3M as a fast track manager. And he says to me, look, if you go do that, your life's going to be very predictable. You'll be a manager, then you'll be a VP, then you'll be a GM, and you'll have this very predictable path. And if you join Wealth, who knows what will happen, but I suspect you'll be successful enough that you'll never leave. What and year is this? What year is this? This was 1992. 1992. So, so for our listeners who don't know what an RIA is, can you give a little bit of background on that? Because I want to ask the questions. It's an investment management, a group that takes care of your wealth, outside of a brokerage business and charges a fee. Okay. And, and so in 1992, yeah. the, 1992 though, now th th this is the business, by the way, I'm, you guys, listeners who, who listen to the show know, because I've been talking about my new private equity business where, where this is a business now that's a very big deal in the wealth management space. But in 1992, an independent yeah, RIA, yeah. that was like, like that, that was not, that was an yeah. unusual place to be. Is that it correct? It was very unusual, but I didn't know any different. It was just a job. <laughs> And I was a good salesman. So we took this business with 30 million. I, I, I was an intern, but I was very, people liked my accent and they and thought I was quite good at, at what I did. And so I grew that to a billion dollars very quickly. And at that time, that was a very large firm uh, for an independent firm. We had great technology. We built the first, what's called a turnkey asset management, the wrapping of mutual funds or ETFs. That was never done until we started doing it. We sold that business to General Electric when I was 34 years old. And so I was became president of that firm, had a big percentage of it. We sold that to GE. We had private equity. We'd done some acquisitions. That firm is now a public company, got spun up by GE. It's called AssetMark. Uh, and it's now a multi-billion dollar firm. It wasn't that size when we sold it. Uh, it was billions in assets, but not multi-billion dollar value. When, when you and, first got there, when you first got there, and you were a thirty million dollars shop, you were an intern. How how many people were there? Three. And 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 when you guys sold it, and so you worked away hundreds, from hundreds, yeah, hundreds yeah, of yeah, employees yeah. and billions yeah. of assets. Yeah. Which I, I want the listeners just kind of like like understand this. And and I have a question for you. I want to kind of before we go go forward. So intern to president of the company, and then you sell the company, which is uh, super impressive by the age of what 33, 34? 34, Yeah. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And how long? How many years was that? Nine that years. Voyage? Nine years. So, so coming in as an intern, nine years later, you sell it as the president of the company. Yeah. I you, you mentioned that you were captain of the rugby team. Were you always a person that like raised your hand to be like the leader? Was this something that came natural to you, or is it something I, that you evolved I into? I couldn't control it, and it's not because I was ever the best athlete ever. I just knew that I it was my job to do what no one else would be willing to do. And that mm -hmm. wasn't lead. I just would, any time the bad thing had to be done, I would be the one to throw myself on the grenade. And it led people to go, this, I don't know why, but I want to be with this guy. And I, I've always, my whole life, people have just said, I just want a piece of whatever this guy's doing. And I what, can't you, explain where, it. Where, where do you think it comes from, if you had to guess? I think it's that I am 100% real at all times. Like, I don't think anyone who's ever met me wouldn't go, this dude is 100%, no games, all real. And I have always been give first, take later. Like, mm -hmm. one thing I'll say, like, people say I'm a pretty good salesman, but the reality is I might not be the smartest, I might not be the richest, I might not be, be the hardest working, but I can assure you no one will care more for your well-being than I will. Like, I will always do what's necessary to take care of you. That's because I had to do it for my sisters. I had to do it for my mom. I've had to do it my whole life. And I think underneath everything, at a guttural human level, people see, without knowing what they're seeing, that someone has the resilience and the care and kindness to really do what's right to take care of them. And it, you don't need words. You, don't, you feel it when you meet someone. This is somebody who I have faith in and who I can trust. And life, in all instances, we make decisions based on the depth of genuine trust we have in them. That's true of our families. It's true of our friends. That everything is based on how trust, how, how much deep trust do I have in this person? And if you have deep trust in someone, you will go to the ends of the world for them. And that's been the key of any business I've built, 
that there is at the foundational level. And by the way, when I was younger, I was a hothead and really not pleasant to work with. I think I've evolved. But underneath it all, people are like, this is a decent human being who might be broken, but he will always do the right thing, even if think, he disagrees. Let me, let me ask you a question, because I actually, it's funny when, as we've gotten to know each other, I, I think I see a lot of myself in you. Um, like everything you're describing, I'm like, that's how I feel, right? And so when you say it, I'm like, uh-huh, that's how I feel. And one thing that in being that type of a person where I've always been one to be like, that's not fair and I'm going to call it out even if it's an unpopular thing to say and I will take the grenades and I will feel the pain because that's the right thing to do at this moment. I've found that rarely is it reciprocated and I've been disappointed in a lot of people over my life because of it. How do you feel about that? I, I have learned that if I'm ever disappointed, it's because I have irrational expectations. I'm a big student <laughs> of Vedanta. And disappointment mm -hmm. is either a reflection of you having misguided expectations mm -hmm. or you're being selfish. It's one of those two. It's always one of those two. If yeah. I am frustrated at my truly, exceptionally awesome wife, it is never her fault. It's that I want something from her that is either selfish or that she is not the human who would do that thing. Yeah. And it's very, very hard. I'm a huge believer in extreme accountability, like extreme ownership. I will never yeah. blame anyone for anything in my life because it's mine. And I choose to react however I choose. I choose to set the expectations. And if somebody doesn't live up to my expectations, then my expectations were wrong. And yeah. as a parent of three amazing daughters, whenever I've had a fallout with any of them, especially I have a 15-year-old now, my youngest, but I'm reminded of it all the time. If we have any falling out, it's not her fault. It's my fault because I'm the mature one. I have expectations that are not reasonable or I want something that she doesn't want to give me, which is selfish. So I think... If we all as humans spent less time pointing fingers and spent more time going, why do I need this? Why does it hurt me? What am I feeling that, that's causing me to, to be hurt by this or angry mm -hmm. by this? It's usually rooted in some fear or some insecurity that you haven't actually stared at. And so, I, I, again, because I meditate and read so much about how we all think about this world, I always just start with me. Yeah. It's, it's pointless getting frustrated at the circumstances because they are what they are. And one of the lessons I try to teach my girls is the outcome is not something you get to choose. There mm. is, like, you can give your best to a game and still lose. But as long as you've given it everything you've got, all you can do be is spent and bummed that you lost, but you won't kick yourself over it. Because you had no say over whether you ultimately won or not. Things happen that you have no control over. That's true in business. It's true in life. It's true in everything you do. That you can give it your best crack. And ultimately, if you worry about the outcome, you'll take shortcuts to ensure an outcome that maybe you wasn't meant to be. So, again, because especially in America, we're so results-oriented, and I'm no different. I'm a competitive mm -hmm. human being. I try to remind myself, hey, this isn't about anyone else. This is about me. It's about what I gave. And what I get will get taken care of. And sometimes the biggest losses end up being the biggest, most valuable lessons you'll have years later, which is hard to absorb when you've just taken a crack in the teeth. But there's not a moment where I wasn't knocked back on my ass, where I didn't look back years later and say, oh, my God, thank God I got kicked in the teeth the way that I did. Yeah. But as you, when you're younger... You take it personally, and this person did me wrong, and that person disappointed me. I'll tell you, in the last business, I made 150 millionaires. And as you've seen, I think I've had an impact on the industry that, that is outsized for a little Zimbabwean guy who came here with 200 bucks. <laughs> and yet, definitely, there will be people who don't know me who say I'm an arrogant this and arrogant that, and he's an opinionated that, and some of it might be accurate, and it doesn't matter. What I know is the people who are closest to me have the most love for me. And that's the most important thing, really, because they know you. And yeah. they will, nonetheless, even though I made 150 millionaires, how many of them sent me a note of thank you? 
three. Wow. The prior firm, That's... dozens of millionaires, one. Why? Wow. Because when people get to that outcome, they almost always feel like I earned it, I deserved it, and they did. And usually it's like, man, I should have gotten even more because they're comparing the sauce to everyone else. They don't go, I don't know where I could have gone that I would have made $8 million, $10 million. Where else could that have been? And thanks, Joe, for giving me that crack. And by the way, everyone who I've worked with typically goes on to do spectacular things, and I know they appreciate it. You just never think to say, hey, I couldn't have done it without you. And I'm very good about telling them all, you deserved it and earned it, and I'd say it all the time, and so they felt like that. And it's true. They did, and they, they deserved it. But people, look, we're all selfish human beings. We're all right. on our voyage. We're gonna, we were born alone and we'll die alone. And that's the reality. And the truth is most people use other people's success as a gauge for their own success or failure. They don't really care whether you win or lose. They just get annoyed that you, you're beating them. Even though it's you're a right. fixed, it, they just act like it's a fixed pie. And by you succeeding, you're taking something from them. And I tell everyone, it's not a fixed pie. Everything you give, the pie will get bigger and your slice will grow even if it's a smaller percentage. And I tend to be a make the pie bigger human being because if you contribute and make the pie bigger, you'll be fine. And by the way, if you don't get it financially, you'll get in other ways. You know, I wrote the first check, hired the first person and built United Capital from scratch. We sold it for $800 million. And wow. I had, by the end of it, 12, 13%, which is amazing. But I had brought so many people along, and most people in my shoes, certainly the second go around, would have kept 70, 80%. And my wife would always say, My God, you give away so much. I'm like, Honey, I have an amazing marriage. I've got great health. I have amazing kids. And the universe is taking care of me the things that I really care about. And money just is not one of them. And that view that go, especially because of what I do in the wealth space, we all get consumed by a number. And I have seen countless people get to the biggest numbers you could imagine and mm -hmm. be the most miserable human beings with multiple failed marriages, with awful relations with their kids, so obsessed with a number that means nothing. And when they die, guess what? How much of it they take with them? None of Zero. it. The yeah. only thing that will be left is the impact that you made on the people around you. That's all that will be left. And that'll be gone too. But isn't it nice if people look back at the end of your life and say, God, what would my life been like if that dude hadn't showed up on the planet? Yeah. And guess what? The millions you leave behind, the billions you leave behind, not one of those dollars gives a shit about you. But every <laughs> human you touched, yeah. you can have countless impact. And that for me is the most exciting thing about being a human, that you get to have this outsized impact in exponential ways for every good act you have. And you might never wanna, get uh, to see it. I, I want to, I want to, you, you kind of came to the punchline on United, but, but I, I love the story of United Capital, you know, and I want to, so I want to rewind a little bit. So, so you end up selling a Centurion. You're at, tell us a little bit about that, that exit from G, G. Oh, it was, I, it was I, awful. It, so I wrote my second book then, and I interviewed a hundred uh, YPOs, entrepreneurs who built and sold companies. And I, I asked them all, I said, I'm writing a book about how to build a sellable business. And I said, I would like to start at the end. What was it like after you sold it? And they would say, oh, it's amazing. It's American dream, blah, blah, blah. And I'd say, and it's, by the way, male, female, people all over the world. I'm like, God, I don't feel that way at all. And 100% of them, 100% said me either. You can't really say it, but it was like a death in the family. I made sacrifices I should have made and everything else. And that was the beginning of this idea that money's just fuel. And we get lost in money rather than in life. So I thought I'm going to build a wealth management firm that talks about life and not about money, that realizes money is an emotional category. And I brought in behavioral economics, great technology, and built this really industry-changing brand because United Capital, prior to us doing it, was all about men talking about wealth and beta and alpha and IRR. And I'm like, I don't care about any of that. Even though I have academic training and CFA and went to great graduate schools, I'm like, hell no. I want to talk about life. And that business, again, we grew it to 25 billion in assets and 800 employees all over the country, sold it to Goldman. And it was, the whole industry has changed as a consequence of it. So, you know, again, 
You never know how your crazy ideas will. At the time, by the way, like my first company, everyone said I was nuts doing what we were doing. Why are you talking about feelings? Why are you bringing in so many women executives? I'm like, you know why? Because wealth is fuel for your life. And mm. we need a more diff a completely different lens about how we talk about money. And so that was the whole idea. And again, it was an incredible voyage. And then I joined Goldman, a really eye-opening experience because the people were amazing. And I learned a ton about operating at that size because, again, it was just so much bigger. And it's an operation, 50,000 employees, billions and billions in assets and run by, you know, again, only 400 people. So it was quite an interesting experience. Learned a ton. But last holidays, you know, I was on vacation with my kids and my wife and daughters were like, I've been at Goldman for four years. Dad, you don't seem happy. And I'm like, you're right. I'm not happy. And I've always, when I realize I'm on the wrong track, I cannot go one more day without correcting it. So I just knew mm. at that moment, right at the holidays, I'm like, you know what? I got to change things. I'm not, while it's very intoxicating, being a partner at Goldman, going to New York every two weeks and my offices were there, it's very intoxicating. But I'm like, who cares about any of that? I, am I making an impact? Because I'm on this planet to make an impact. And I don't think I can move the Goldman ship the way I can do other things. So I left. And at the time, people were like, are you crazy? And I was like, you know what? I just can't. I'm not on this planet to coast. It's not my thing. Uh, I want to make an impact, and this is what I, I got to change things. And then you and I met, and uh, hopefully we're going to change the world again. Yeah, man. I mean, uh, that's the plan. So, look, you've had a pretty illustrious, uh, very illustrious you know, entrepreneurial career. You've you've changed an industry, and, and I'm and I'm going to give a little bit of feedback because I think it's a lot of folks. If you're in like a really sexy industry like fashion or music or film, you know, people know who those rock stars are. Um, in the business world, if you're in tech, it's 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 a little bit more obvious because they get the covers of the magazines. In, in these more niche industries like wealth, and even my former industry, like my former industry does not have what there is in wealth. And 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 so I'm going to say this, and and you know you know this already, but I'm going to say it just because the audience needs to hear it. Joe is legitimately a freaking rock star in the wealth management space. It's 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 weird coming from a different space and seeing it because it's like I'm not that doesn't really exist in housing or in mortgage, but it does exist in wealth. Why do you think that is? Cause I'm, it's, it's kind of, it's been, it's been an unusual thing for me to experience. I'm, <laughs> I, 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 I've never seen it before in, in other industries. You know what, when you talk differently than everyone else and you have, again, you have to have success. Otherwise you're just a guy talking. Um, I think because I wrote so much about where I thought things were going and it turned out to be genuinely, generally accurate and we had enough success shared with enough people and I think I've been mostly a good person in every way that I've tried my best to be a good person and of course it matters that you're well spoken and of course it matters that you're successful but ultimately it matters that you're making an impact and affecting the way people think. That's what mm. a visionary does. It affects the way you live your everyday life. And in, my, in our little world of wealth management, there weren't a lot of people doing things who weren't looking at what I was writing and saying about where I thought things were headed. And again, I, I love music. I play guitar, but I, I don't know if a rock star is the right word. I just know that because I, was, I did it for 15 years and was so vocal about my failures and our successes and what was working or not, being vulnerable, being super open, but also being generally accurate about what was missing and what could be better. And it inspired, as you know now, this whole new generation of incredible firms that are saying, taking those ideas and have taken them to places I could never have imagined. But they all are very gracious about, Joe, I started this because I followed you for a decade and followed everything you said. And we thought we could yeah. take that idea and take it even further. And they have. And that's, you know, we were just talking about it earlier. It's just remarkable when I get on the phone with people I've never met who've heard me speak or uh, read what I've written and or followed me a lot through the decades and just said, I've done everything based on what you did. And and by the way, the most important thing, they're amazing people who've built amazing things. And I'm like, I can't believe that I had even the slightest impact 
this dude from Zimbabwe who was literally had nothing going for him. I'm like, I don't even know how it happened. But that for me is much more rewarding than any financial outcome. Like what an amazing thing to have shaped that many lives that I'll never know how many of those people there are who are delivering things to clients that never would have received them had I not come here, had we not changed the dialogue to talk about what a real wealth advisor should do, which is care deeply about your entire life to help you remove financial anxiety. Like that's not the way people talked prior to United Capital. People would talk about wealth as an investment solution, maybe a financial plan. And we changed the discussion to be like, look, if you're an advisor, your responsibility is to take the financial stress out of people's lives, to make their lives easier, to help make things more comprehensive, to understand who they are so that they don't make screw ups in their life that ruin it. Because it doesn't matter if you outperform the market or not. What really matters is, are you making choices that align with your values? That's all mm -hmm. that really matters. Like, I promise you, when you look back at your life, the things you will remember when you had to make a trade-off between money and something that was true to yourself. Like, I always wanted to be close to my family, but I chose to be away from them to make money. And whether you feel good or bad, those moments in your life where you didn't live up to your highest ideal of who you wanted to be will be the moments you regret forever. There is an ideal version of us that we all have in our mind. And then there's the real version and the gap between who we want to be and who we are. The narrower that gap is, the more energetic, the more happy, the more authentic and real you'll be. But that gap, if you don't monitor it and say, am I truly who I want to be? Am I acting like that ideal version of me? And how frequently is that not true? And it will be true often that you don't live up to the best version of you. But if you don't take the time every day, I meditate, but every day and go, at what times today was I not my best version? Hmm. Do I wish I'd have done something differently? And then even if you don't want to take the time to fix it or apologize, to just say, just stew in it a bit, live in the regret a bit, and then say, I got to do better. You just do that day after day after day after day. It compounds out so that the gap narrows and narrows and narrows and narrows. And you can't change the past, but you can have a huge impact in how you think about the future and the version of you that you are. And that's uh -huh. truly life's tr deepest and most important voyage is that. Like, hey, how far am I between who I want to be and who I am? That includes exercise. It includes being a loving husband or a good dad, mom whatever you are, sister, brother, daughter, son, those things matter. And we can blame everyone else, but it's going to fix nothing if you don't start by saying, what was my role in this outcome? and How do I change my role? And I want to share a personal story because I think it plays to this. My stepdad's in Africa. He was just here for Thanksgiving. Um, he's only six years older than me. My mom was the original cougar. She died <laughs> when, I was, uh, when she was 52 years and years ago. But we're still very, very close, my stepdad and I. And he has a son, and he's a loving uh, young man. But they've fallen apart, and he's annoyed my stepdad with his son. And they both love each other. And I said to him, look, can you stop being mad at him? Because you both love each other, and he is who he is. So if you want a loving relationship, you need to change you. And if he changes... Great. But if not, you got to love him on his terms, even if it's selfish, even if you think it's wrong, do it anyway. Because at least you'll know that you have a loving relationship with him, even if he doesn't love you back. And mm. if that's what you want, it's the only thing you can control. And we spent four hours just talking philosophically about that idea that, hey, you have the choice. And so don't blame your circumstances. Don't blame anyone else because it's going to be what it's going to be. You just have to be willing to say, what am I going to change about me and my perspective or my actions to actually feel good that I am narrowing the gap between who I want to be and who I am? How do you, let, let me ask you a question because what you're talking about, I, I've seen it, I, I, we've talked a little bit about this in the past, but 
I've actually seen there, there be an application in how you build businesses in this way. And I, and I know we're talking about the, the interpersonal self, yeah. but, but, but a lot of our listeners are very high level CEOs growing big businesses, yeah. but I actually like everything you just said, I'm like, that sounds like how you treated United Capital. That it's sounds exactly like- exactly how I've run every business. You know why? Because there's this thing we, many entrepreneurs have, many CEOs have that this is CEO me and this is personal me. And I chose to break those walls apart. I'm like, I'm going to bring the real me to everything because I don't want to have work me, be miserable, salty, go get him guy, and then go home and be this loving, fun, loving guy. And when I was young, the first company I built, people were like, would you believe that Joe's like this party animal? And like, <laughs> I was 28, you know, I was a young kid. Yeah, and yeah. people would be like, he's so serious and buttoned up. And finally, I'm like, why the hell am I so serious and buttoned up? Like, I'm a fun guy. And people like me and have fun with me. Like, why don't I bring that to work? It was remarkable how much quicker our business grew, how much better the talent we recruited when we narrowed the gap. And I said, what kind of company do we want to be? And then what kind of people do we want in it? And let's just narrow the gap. And as you know, at Rise, we have three simple rules. We're good people. And what does that mean? We do the right bloody thing. Number two, we do work that matters. So only do the things that make you proud, that are important and make a difference. And third, we have a great time. Like those are three really simple rules that you can have to run a business. And it's been very effective for me. It's allowed for, for us to always have a great voyage. We've fortunately been successful too. And my stepdad will tell you, he can't believe we were successful because he always believed and told me this, and I believed it too. In order to be successful, you must sacrifice, you must suffer. Well, that's not true. That's just a story we tell ourselves because in order to get to success, most entrepreneurs went through huge suffering. We are all broken human beings. There's very few entrepreneurs who don't have come from suffering and pain and insecurity. And so we bring that into our souls and make that part of our ethos, but it's not true. And when you let that narrative go, when you let that falsehood go, it's remarkable how you can create a business that can be successful and also fun and most importantly, mission-driven and actually be proud of every day that attracts, like a lighthouse, the most attractive people, the most brilliant people. What do you, um, you know, you had said earlier, you were talking about not being like obviously you're you you're a competitive person and you have that fire burning inside of you and and you've accomplished so much, but you said something that that maybe might be counterintuitive to listeners who who heard you say one thing you said that you're not focused on the outcome you're not trying to create an outcome, and yet like you've had these amazing outcomes consistently happen, and I know that like for me i I've struggled with that in my life, and I think other people struggle with that. Why do you think that is? I think that, first of all, people are, we tend to be very messy thinkers. And I am long term greedy rather than short term greedy. And what that means is I'm thinking five years out, not next week. And the advantage of having a privately held company is you can think long term greedy. And so what you want to do is say, where do I want to be in five years? And break it down into increments that are manageable and bite sized to be crystal clear. But if I want to be there in five years, what has to be true today? What has to be true six months from now? What has to be true year, a, a year from now? As you know, when we were starting this, we had a mountain of things to do. I'm like, guys, only two things matter. We're going to get the right partners in place, and we're going to get the right financials in place. Everything else is secondary. Because if we don't get that, we don't get to the next space. And the way you need to think about it, my next book, my fourth book, is on this idea. I'm calling it The Voyage. And it's this idea that you are not going to end up where you think you're going. I've never started a business that ended up looking the way I started expecting it to look. Think about Columbus going to India. He didn't get where he thought he was going. He got somewhere better. And it's true of every entrepreneur. Wherever you think you're going to be in five years, it will be different. And so what you want to do is be clear about where you want to head generally and then just get to the first oasis. Because once you get to that next oasis or the next island in your voyage, you're going to have a bigger boat. It's going to change the trajectory of next stops that you might go to. You're going to have different people on that boat. 
and you're going to have different supplies on that boat. You might be able to go a lot further and you'll get to the next island and then you're going to say, oh, wow, look at that over there. And you're going to see opportunities. So being agile, but persistent and have a long-term greedy view, the outcome will be whatever it is. I never imagined I'd sell to Goldman Sachs. I never imagined I'd be a partner of Goldman. And yet there it happened. I was just looking to build the best thing I could and keep growing and cre keep creating a great business that was built to last with great culture, making an impact, and just get to the next stop. And then we'll figure out what goes next. So, you know, again, nowadays, five years is too far out. I think a three-year increments are more than enough. But break that three years into one year. Once you get to the end of one year, ask yourself, is that three-year goal too con conservative? Should it change? And make the pivots. Yeah, I love that, man. Um, Persistence, adaptability, and optimism. Those are the three. Like, those are the magic three if you're going to be successful. All right, listeners, you heard that. We're going to put it in the show notes. So you got to tattoo it on your arm. Um, I want to, you know, the, the, we're, we're coming here at the end of the show. We have about nine minutes. I want to talk about one thing and I want to go to the greatness question. So there's something I learned from you that um, I never heard someone say before. And it, 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 it made me actually, th I kind of started going back through my life and thinking how I had applied it. So you talked about this concept of working at the top of your license and how you, when you talk to young young folks who are looking to really, you know, do great things in the world, that, that you think that's really important. Do you, would you mind teaching our audience what that means? Because I think that was one of the more profound things I've learned from working with you. So uh, working at the top of your license basically means leaning into your strengths and spending your time, the vast majority of your work life, on the things you're great at. I'm not a detail guy. I hate operations. Uh, and all of the specific things that aren't about laying new grounds. I am a guy who needs to be out on the boat finding and charting new waters. But I recognize if somebody's not making sure people are fed and taken care of, I'm going to fail. Now, when you start up in your career, you're going to have to do it all. And you're going to learn what you're drawn to and what you're not. And as you get more mature, you're going to have things you're great at and things you're very marginal at. And you need to, if you're going to be successful, recognize where you are not contributive, where you're there but not adding value because that's how you will fail. You will fail because you won't pay attention to it. So you either have to become marginally better, which is a waste of your time because then you're not working on your best skills, the top of your license. But you can't ignore the fact that you have to be well-rounded to succeed as a human and as a business person. Then you need to complement it. So my first partners are always people who are great at things that I'm not great at. Like you are an amazing guy and following through at all the stuff that I have no interest in reading the shareholder agreements. And now I'm good at it, but I'm, I hate it. And I know it's not what I'm great at. What I'm great at is telling the story, figuring out where we need to go. I'm pretty good at making sure the math works, but what you need to do in every environment is say, where I'm not great, I got to bring great in and surround yourself with people who allow you to shine in the things that you are put on this earth to do. And that's true in a business context too. When you hire somebody, there's a great expression my um, Bob, my uh, former chairman had, which is every single diamond, even the perfect ones have an inclusion. Now, mm. every diamond is, also has brilliance. And Julius Caesar had this expression, whenever you take uh, any group of people over, he was one of the greatest conquerors in the world. The reason the Roman Empire was so successful is whenever they took over a new group of people, they would say, what's their brilliance? And they would use that brilliance for the success of the Roman Empire. Mm. So they'd have a group that were really great with fabrics or with spices or with warcraft. They would say, this is what we're using and taking from this group to make the Republic better, to make, again, whether you approve of their conquering ways or not, you can still learn from the idea that, and this was Julius Caesar, that every human has a brilliance. Every person, every group of people have a brilliance that they can contribute to you. And that's true, by the way, of anyone you meet in your life. So this idea of you practicing at the top of your license, it's also true that everyone you meet has the opportunity to teach you something, no matter how superior you might feel to them. And I put quotation marks around that. Because truly, nobody's better than anyone. But 
if you take that view that everyone is in front of you for a reason and has some form of brilliance to share with you, and also, by the way, has an inclusion so that I very early on, whenever I work with anyone, I go, what is their inclusion? What is the carbon mm. footprint in here? And can I live with it? So I like them when they're really obvious because then it's like, <laughs> okay, they're really obvious. No one's going to see their brilliance. And I know I'm not going to mention his name. You know who I'm thinking about. Yeah, yeah. Who has the minute I met him, I'm like, oh, this is a guy who absolutely gets underestimated by everybody. And I immediately went, he must have an incredible brilliance and he does. Yeah. I love that. I was going to ask you what my inclusion is, but we'll leave that off air. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's, let's, let's go. You know, we got a couple minutes left. I'd love for us to get to the greatness question and we'll get the show wrapped up. And um, man, you first care of all, too much. Yeah. I care too much. You care too much. Uh, uh, it's the fatal flaw of most entrepreneurs. They are overwhelmingly loyal and actually don't realize that by caring so much, you end up harming the other person, that you're not actually being kind by softening the blow, by being too gentle and not being direct and straightforward when somebody's not. And I will share that with you because I love you. And I see that it's a lovely, lovely flaw to have. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> it's not one that I have. <laughs> yeah. But it, I, probably, I, it, it balances out, though, because I'm yes. learning from you. So yeah. that's good. <laughs> I love that. All right. I appreciate that. That's good. And, and I actually appreciate that you shared it. Um, <laughs> well, man, listen, first of all, I'm so pumped to have for us to be on this voyage together. And, um, and the fact that we did the podcast second and the voyage first is even better. That's good. Um, and um, yeah, let's, let's go to the greatest question and we'll get wrapped up here. So uh, listeners, you know, the greatness question. And when we have greatness, like Joe Duran on the show, we love to hear it, which by the way, man, you've been dropping like, like this could have been 10 episodes of greatness that you dropped <laughs> on the show. So I really, I really do appreciate the amount of knowledge bombs you've been dropping for our, for myself and for the audience. I always learn from our guests and this has been a great episode. So, but let's end with our greatness question. So what is the, the number one barrier to creating greatness that you've overcome in your life and how did you overcome it? Asking the question, what if I'm wrong? Uh, when I was younger, 28, 29, when we first crossed the billion dollar threshold, I really believed we were indestructible. I was an arrogant ass. I listened to nobody, surrounded myself with people just like me who kissed my ass. And I was not a great husband, to tell you the truth. And I don't think I, I would have been a great dad either or even a great friend, because I just always presumed I was right. And the most important thing I learned when I started studying deeply, um, and I learned this from the Dalai Lama, which is every good act comes from humility, started mm. with the question, what if I'm wrong? If you ask that question of yourself in everything that you do, you open the door to possibilities about yourself and the people around you that allows you to be vulnerable and open to corrections and to growing. If you are not willing to ask yourself, what if I'm wrong, you will stop growing. And your requirement as a human, you either grow or die as a human. Mm. And that should be true until the day you die. That if you ask, not because you have lack of confidence, not because you have lack of belief, but just ask the question, what if I'm wrong? In every relation, with your kids, with your spouses, with your relationships, with your workers, it allows for people to challenge you. Even if you are an opinionated ass like me, everyone knows. Just challenge him. And I, I'll ask a lot of questions and I will pivot the minute I realize, oh, you're right. Vulnerability and being wrong, believe it or not, is hugely important to attracting the most amazing things to your life. So to me, that would be the, the counterintuitive but honest answer that led to my most success in this world is just being open to being wrong. And most importantly, in your opinions, your opinions are not facts. They're just thoughts that you have that will change. Love that, man. Joe John and Duran. Lastly, I just want to say, yeah, you can have anything in this world, but it starts with your thoughts. You're a prisoner of your thoughts. So just spend time asking yourself, why do I think how I do? And is it serving me? Is it actually helping me? to get the life that I want, because you can have anything you want in this world. Darius, I've really enjoyed this. I, I know I've done nothing but talk. But no, I hope no. anyone listening that this has been useful in some 
small way. And uh, thanks for uh, for having me on. Yeah, the, you know, the, the, the pleasure was mine. So much gratitude from me to get to, like I said, spend time with you like this. And um, for listeners, look, I have a front row seat to seeing someone that's manifested a beautiful life for himself. Uh, don't take any of these words anything but to heart because he has really created a lot of beautiful things in the world and i'm really excited to, to be on a journey with you to create more so thank you so much joe you until bet, next man. time peace out everybody have a good one I love you you are listening to the greatness machine and that's a wrap for today listen if you love what you heard subscribe to the show on whatever podcast platform that you're tuning in on so that you don't miss any of our future episodes. We have tons of great people coming on and we're, we're stoked to have you here to enjoy it with us. Leave us a review. Tell us what you love most about this particular episode. We love getting the reviews. We love to see what you guys love most. And if this particular episode, you know, made you think of someone who's leveling up in their business and in their life, print screen, share it with them. Leaders are the best givers. And after all, we're all here to support and grow with each other. And in case you want to see some of the fun behind the scenes shots or some of the things that we're doing, I'm actually writing about this in my weekly newsletter. Go to www.therealdarius.com and subscribe to my newsletter. We're talking about fun things like business and life and mindfulness and cryptocurrencies and gosh, I don't even know everything and anything, but it's tons of fun stuff I write about. I try to get it out on a weekly basis. You can subscribe at www.therealdarius.com. And with that said, look, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. I love you. Peace. We're out of here. See you guys on the next one. Uh-huh. She's my lover.